Inflation is a very serious subject. You can argue it's the way democracies die. So it's a huge danger once you've got a populace that learns it can vote itself money. If you look at the Roman Republic, they inflated the currency steadily for hundreds of years, and eventually the whole damn Roman Empire collapsed. So it's the biggest long-range danger we have, probably, apart from nuclear war. The safe assumption for an investor is that over the next 100 years, the currency is going to zero. That's my working hypothesis. We've done something pretty extreme, and we don't know how bad the troubles will be, whether we're going to be like Japan or, or something a lot worse. And what makes life interesting is we don't know how it's going to work out. I think we do know we're flirting with serious trouble. I think we also know that some of our earlier fears were, were overblown. Japan is still existing as a civilized nation in spite of unbelievable excess by all former standards in terms of money printing. Think of how seductive it is. You have a bunch of interest-bearing debts and you pay them off with checking accounts, which you're no longer paying interest. Think of how seductive that is for a bunch of legislators. You get rid of the interest payments and you, the money supply goes up. It seems like heaven. And of course, when things get that seductive, they're likely to be overused. Not only do we have a serious problem, but the solution to it that is the easiest for the politicians and for the Federal Reserve too, for that matter, is just to print more money and solve the temporary problems that way. And that, of course, is going to have some long-term dangers. And, and we know what happened in Germany when the Weimar Republic just kept printing money. The whole thing blew up, and that was a contributor to the rise of Hitler. So all this stuff is dangerous and serious, and we don't want to have a bunch of politicians just doing whatever is easy on the theory that it didn't hurt us last time so we can double it and do it one more time and then we double it again and so forth. We know what happens on that everlasting doubling, doubling, doubling. You will have a very different government if you keep doing that enough. And so you're flirting with danger somewhere unless there's some discipline in the process. But I don't regard Japan as in some terrible danger. Having They've done a huge amount of this and gotten by with it. I don't think we'll be as good at handling our problems as Japan is. But there again, it's an interesting thing. If you take the last 100 years, 1922 to 2022, most of modernity came in in that 100 years. And in the previous 100 years, that got another big chunk of modernity. And before that, things were pretty much the same for the previous thousands of years. Life was pretty brutal and short, limited, and what have you. No printing press, no air conditioning, no modern medicine, no. And I don't think we're going to get things that were in what I call the real human needs. Think of what it meant to get, say, first you got the steam engine, the steamship, the railroad, and a little bit of improvement in farming and a little bit of improvement in plumbing. That's what you got in the in the 100 years that ended in 1922. The next 100 years gave us widely distributed electricity, modern medicine, modern firefighters, the automobile, the airplane, the, the records, the movies, the air conditioning in the South. Think what a blessing it was. If you wanted three children, you had to have six because three died in infancy. That was our ancestors. Think of the agony of watching half your children die. It just, it's amazing how much achievement there's been in civilization in these last 200 years and most of it in the last 100 years. Now the trouble with it is, is, is that the basic needs are pretty well filled. In the United States, the principal problem of the poor people is they're too fat. That is a very different place from what happened in the past. The, the past, they were on the edge of starving. And what happens is, it's really interesting, is with all this enormous increase in living standards and freedom and diminishment of racial inequities and all the huge progress that has come, people are less happy about the state of affairs than they were when things were way tougher. And that has a very simple explanation. The world is not driven by greed, it's driven by envy. And so the fact that everybody's five times better off than they used to be 
they take it for granted. All they think about is somebody else has having more now, and it's not fair that he should have it, and they don't. That's the reason that God came down and told Moses that you couldn't envy your neighbor's wife or even his donkey. I mean, even the, the old Jews were having trouble with envy. And so it's built into the nature of things. It's weird for somebody my age because I was in the middle of the Great Depression, the hardship was unbelievable. I was safer walking around Omaha in the evening than I am in my own neighborhood in Los Angeles after all this great wealth and so forth. So, And I, I have no way of doing anything about it. I can't change the fact that a lot of people are very unhappy and feel very abused after everything's improved by about 600% because there's still somebody else who has more. I have conquered envy in my own life. I don't envy anybody. I don't give a damn what somebody else has. But other people are driven crazy by it. And other people play to the envy in order to advance their own political careers. And we have whole networks now that are, they want to pour gasoline on the flames of envy. 